Hi, I'm Karen Ignani, President and CEO of Emblem Health, and I want to welcome you to our second live Facebook Town Hall. Tonight, we're going to focus on our partner, ACPNY, Advantage Care Physicians in New York, and we're going to be joined by three leaders, clinicians from ACPNY. Just to remind all of you that ACPNY has 39 practice locations around New York and Long Island, and tonight we are focusing on questions that you have submitted, and we have three very qualified individuals to do that. Before I introduce all of them, I want to send a special thank you to the clinicians and associates and team members at ACPNY. They have been keeping all of us safe during these very dangerous times, and we want to say how much we appreciate all of you. And I know on behalf of all of you watching how much you appreciate our colleagues at ACPMY. So first up, our leader at ACP, Dr. Navarro Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is President and Chief Medical Officer of ACPNY. Dr. Rodriguez also practices in Washington Heights, and she's going to be at the top of our session dealing with a number of the questions that you've submitted over the last several weeks. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Dr. Seth Resnick. Dr. Resnick leads our psychiatric practice, our mental health practice, and our behavioral health practice at ACPNY. He is a psychiatrist and is going to be really dealing and delving into the questions you've posed about your mental health, your concerns, and Dr. Resnick has some important messages along those lines. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Beverly Shepard. Dr. Shepard leads our pediatric practice at ACPMY. She's going to be taking your questions, but particularly focusing on why it's very important, even during this pandemic, to think about preventive care for your children and chronic care. Dr. Shepard will talk to us all about that. Before we move to our clinical experts, let me say four things about Emblem Health and a number of the things that we are doing to help support you during these very, very difficult times. First, for those of you who have had a change in circumstances, could have lost your jobs or have a change in your health insurance coverage, I want to just make sure all of you know that we are ready to help and support you. We have partnered with the state of New York to make sure you are aware of all of the alternatives in New York that are available to you. And our our trained associates are standing by, ready to talk you through all of that. And our team of experts, as I'm talking, will be posting our customer service number. So you'll have a way to make sure you're getting the information you need. Second, I want to make sure that all of you know, reading through the questions you sent, we thought it was important to add a chat feature to our COVID-19 uh, part of our website. So you'll see that more interactive feature so in real time we can deal with your questions. We're also updating it with the latest information from CDC, the Center of Disease Control in Washington and um, in Georgia where they're actually located but it's a federal agency and the National Institutes of Health also a federal agency doing very important work on our vaccine uh, side of things, but they're located in Bethesda, Maryland. So we'll be updating regularly, as we have done for some time, information from those important federal agencies, as well as our important agencies in New York and the city agencies. So keeping you up to date on the latest information. Um, some of you who have submitted questions for Dr. Shepard are expectant mothers. I want to just make sure all of you know we have a new Healthy Futures program that Emblem Health has launched, and you can access it uh, through the link posted under me right now. And we hope that you will find it very helpful, particularly during these challenging times. Finally, through our Peace of Mind initiative, we have uh, called a number of you. We've uh, reached out and touched about 30,000 
patients and members of Emblem Health who have chronic illnesses. This is an important time to remember that while we're all dealing with the pandemic, it's very important to keep our chronic illnesses in mind and what we need to do to make sure that we're taking care of our health, all aspects of our health. So with that, over to you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Navarro Rodriguez, President and Chief Medical Officer of Advantage Care Physicians. I lead a team of more than 400 providers and an even broader team of nurses and additional staff at Advantage Care Physicians, or ACPNY for short, with offices across all of New York City, as well as onto Long Island. And I'm proud to say that Advantage Care Physicians has been serving many of the communities that have been hardest hit during this COVID-19 crisis. I want to thank all of you, Emblem Health members and ACPNY patients for joining us today. And I especially want to thank all of you who've sent in questions in advance uh, of our town hall. I'll try to get to answer as many of them as I possibly can, but please, if you have additional questions during the course of the town hall, post them and our social media team will get back to you with answers. So let's jump in. Many of you have asked, how do I know if I should get tested or not? And I think that's a great question. At ACPNY, we think it's important to have a discussion with a provider with regards to testing and symptoms. What we do at ACPNY is we have patients uh, contact providers via virtual visits. And with the virtual visit, we're able to have a good dialogue regarding symptoms, risk factors, other chronic conditions, and our providers are able to more accurately refer patients to our ACPNY locations for the appropriate test either a rapid point of care test or a test with results within three to five days based upon the severity of symptoms and, and the condition. For patients who are not ACPNY patients, I, I would urge you to have a conversation with your primary care provider, or please feel free to look at our website and reach out and schedule a virtual visit with one of our ACPNY providers. So next, Javier asked, are regular checkups available now that doctor's offices aren't busy because of COVID? Well, I have to say at Advantage Care Physicians, we've had our offices open throughout this entire time and we've been available for urgent care as well as acute needs and in-office care with the extension of virtual visits for uh, urgent needs such as COVID-19 screening, but also for primary care and specialty care checkups. We think it's important for patients to continue to take care of their chronic conditions and to ensure that their medical regimens and plans to keep them healthy are on point. So this ability to connect via virtual visits is key. And as we move forward and New York City and New York State comes off pause, we will have more opportunities for more in-office visits moving forward in the weeks ahead. I want to assure everyone that with our in-office visits, we are doing everything at Advantage Care Physicians to keep both patients and our staff safe. And so we have instituted several important protocols in terms of scheduling uh, to ensure appropriate social distancing, uh, mapping out our offices to help support social distancing, uh, limiting the number of appointments to limit the number of individuals within an office at any given time. We're also very strict about screening everyone who comes in our doors, uh, taking temperatures, ensuring that everyone is wearing a mask. We also ensure that all of our staff are wearing masks and protective equipment with each encounter. 
And on top of that, we are aggressively cleaning and disinfecting every public area within the offices and within our exam rooms, disinfecting the exam rooms after every patient visit. So we want to assure everyone that seeking necessary care is safe and appropriate for patients who come to Advantage Care Physicians. So Carl, you asked, I have diet controlled diabetes. Are there specific things I should do to stay safe from COVID-19? As we know, COVID-19 seems to affect those who have chronic uh, conditions more so than others. And conditions like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, or chronic lung disease seem to make patients more vulnerable. But as we continue to learn more about the virus, we will learn more about ways to, of how to protect individuals with these conditions uh, more so that, than other populations. I do think it's important to say that everyone should be very vigilant in terms of protecting themselves, whether or not they have a chronic condition, by frequently washing their hands, wearing masks when out in public, social distancing when you're out and about in public, staying more than six feet away from others if you possibly can, and also frequently disinfecting surfaces and frequently held items in your house or uh, near environment as you go through your day. It's also important for those people who do have chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension to make sure those conditions are under control. We find that folks with uncontrolled diabetes tend to be more at risk for many types of infections. So continuing to follow a good diet, low salt diet, low fat diet, low sugar diet for diabetics and hypertensives or a low cholesterol diet for those people who have high cholesterol and taking one's medicines regularly is important. Please also Make sure you're connecting with your PCP, especially at ACPNY, either telephonically or through a virtual visit or an in-office visit to ensure that you're on the right plan and keeping yourself safe. So a number of you have asked questions about the difference between COVID-19 testing and antibody testing. And so this is a great question because as you hear in the news, there's a lot of discussion about how important testing can be uh, as we move forward and get through this, this crisis. There are a number of tests available, but I want to preface at ACPNY, it's important to know what kind of tests there are and ensure that there's a reliable test that's being used. So there are couple of differences. The first is the COVID-19 molecular test. And that's a test that's done to see if someone is acutely ill with COVID-19. That test is usually done with a nasal swab. So a long swab, put up the, the nasal passages to collect a sample. And that can either be performed as a point of care test at ACPNY offices or sent out to a laboratory. And that is a test that we use to see if someone has an acute infection with COVID-19 or is actively uh, infected and, or infectious uh, with this virus. The second test that you have heard a lot about, I'm sure, is the serum antibody test. And that is a blood test that is drawn to check to see if someone has had a previous uh, exposure to COVID-19 and has evidence of antibodies to COVID-19. So with this, that leads us into our next question. And that is, 
what are antibodies, how do they work, uh, and can antibody tests tell me if I'm immune to the coronavirus? And that's also a, an important question and helpful to know the answer to as you have discussions with your providers about what tests might be right for you. Antibodies are formed in our bodies as a response to an infection or an infectious agent. The body and the human body creates these antibodies or proteins that help fight the infections at that given time, but also help fight future infections with a particular virus or bacteria uh, in, as uh, we move forward. With antibodies, this is a great way to track whether or not someone has been exposed to a virus or a particular illness, and if their body has created an immune reaction uh, to help protect them against that virus. This is really the basis of why we create vaccines. We want vaccines to help our bodies create these antibodies and help us fight off potential future infections. The difficulty at this time with COVID-19 and from what little we know about this virus is it's hard to tell for patients if they develop antibodies, does that really mean that they are immune? And if they have antibodies, we're not quite sure how long those antibodies will last and be effective against potential future infections. So it's very important for individuals, despite a, a positive or negative antibody status, to continue to practice safe practices and hygiene practices to minimize exposure and transmission of COVID-19. Now, Brenda, you asked, how can you tell the difference between congestion from an allergy and difficulty breathing from COVID-19? Great question. So mild COVID-19 symptoms can be difficult to distinguish from other symptoms like allergies or colds and flus because some of these things may be very symptom uh, similar and at this time of year, when everything is in bloom and the pollen counts start to rise, it's not unusual for people to have nasal or sinus congestion uh, as a result of allergies. With COVID-19, in contrast, the congestion tends to be more chest congestion and shortness of breath related to the virus associated oftentimes with fever and other symptoms. Usually allergies by themselves won't create fevers and body aches, etc. But if you have questions about your symptoms, if you think it's allergies and you're not getting better with taking an allergy medication, please contact your primary care provider to discuss your symptoms and really assess What's the right treatment plan for you and way to support your body during this time? And Violet asked, do I have to wipe down meat packages or other frozen items when I get them from the market, if it's going into the freezer? And I will say, as per the CDC, Though it may be possible to transmit the virus or COVID-19 uh, that spreads through respiratory droplets if they're on a surface and you're touching a surface and then touching your hands or your mouth or your eyes, that is usually thought to be a very low likelihood of transmission. And it's thought given food packaging, it's a low likelihood of transmission that the virus would be sustained for any period of time on those packaging or, uh, surfaces. So if you uh, go to the market, you get meats or frozen vegetables and you're putting things away, it's not absolutely necessary to wipe them down or disinfect them. However, 
It's also not harmful to disinfect every package that comes into the into your home. So if you already uh, have a process of wiping things down, continue to do so. I think more importantly is as you come from the market, definitely wear your mask while you're there. Wash your hands or use hand sanitizer frequently after handling any objects within the supermarkets or external markets and when you get home. And definitely continue to frequently disinfect your surfaces in, in the household. And oh, I wish I had more time to answer more questions, but at this point, if you have additional questions, please post them to the social media team for them to respond. And I would like to turn it over to Dr. Seth Resnick to talk about uh, some of our behavioral health concerns. He's our chair of psychiatry and behavioral health at ACPNY. And I would love for him to talk about how we manage through these stressful and anxious times. Thanks, Navara. I'm Dr. Seth Resnick, Chair of the Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Department at Advantage Care Physicians. As we resume this marathon phase of addressing this crisis and look toward phasing in a new normal, and as we collectively determine as a community what that will look like for everyone, we see that life does continue to go on. In many ways, recognizing the milestones embedded in our personal lives and our cultural heritage serve as a stabilizing force and a source of comfort in this time of great upheaval and turbulence. I've been speaking with patients about the importance of maintaining structure and routine in our everyday lives to keep us going when so much around us is changing. This crisis calls for great adaptability and flexibility if we're to be resilient and bounce back as individuals and as a country. And in order to succeed in that, it's also essential that we stay grounded, that we plan our days and even look to some grounding ahead of us. In April, we had various religious observances of Easter, Passover, and Ramadan, which we all observed in different, but as I've encouraged, in just as, if not even more, meaningful ways. In May, we've celebrated our nurse appreciation, as well as teacher appreciation, and there is certainly no other time more than the present when we can really recognize and be grateful for all of the hard work and dedication these professionals, both on the front line of battling this pandemic uh, and adapting to radically new ways to support our families and our children so we can keep functioning and forging ahead as a society. May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. And I hope we're reminded now just how important taking care and getting help to find peace of mind and wellness in this global health crisis is. We also must, now more than ever, make sure that we support our brothers and sisters who are suffering from severe mental illness, to make sure resources are maintained to help those in great need, particularly now, and ensure that those who have been in the shadows, where many of us now find ourselves, are not forgotten. Memorial Day will also soon be here. There will surely be programming and ways in our communities to observe this holiday virtually. And I encourage us all to really take time in that moment. It need not be with any particular activity. By now, we're perhaps learning a lesson of simplicity. For its relevance for people we've lost in the past, it's ever more salient today when we've lost so many loved ones in another monumental and worldwide battle. Our soldiers continue to serve heroic roles, even against this invisible enemy, as the National Guard valiantly and amazingly put together and continue to build tremendous capacity to serve thousands more patients here in our backyards. We also appreciate our uh, scarred and fallen soldiers of the day, our healthcare workers, who face this disease on the front line every single day. We must continue to support them as they have us after this battle is fought and won. 
we've lost that sense of certainty, that sense of safety, sense of predictability. And so it stands to reason that all of that leaves us feeling dislocated and unsure about what's going to happen next. We have lost the sense of illusion that really uh, uh, we were thought to be in more control than we are. Guilt doesn't help grief. We feel empowered to acknowledge our grief because we think grief is only real or valid if someone dies. But smaller losses are real and valid too, and grieving them is part of taking care of ourselves. Because when we don't honor it, it shows up in other ways, in our bodies, in our well-being, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You can acknowledge any privilege you may have in facing this crisis while still honoring your losses. Restoration and gratitude are part of grieving. Being present in our sadness is important, while at the same time holding as much gratitude or joy as we can. Um, it's really important for us to be present to the loss um, while we're in it and moving forward through it. Um, it's also important, however, to stay present to restoration, to, to moving forward, um, to finding meaning in our living and to allowing moments of joy to come in to release some of the anxious, anguish. Um, so some of the important things in dealing with loss are caring for yourself. Self-care is part of the restoration process involved in grieving, but it doesn't need to look like a checklist of achievements. One important element of taking care of yourself is setting boundaries. Being able to say, you know, like today is not the day. Connection also is essential and sometimes draining. Connecting with loved ones is important, but it does take effort. So um, additionally, it's important not to forget compassion. Have compassion for yourself. Acknowledge that we're living in abnormal times and don't criticize yourself for feeling grief, whether the loss involves death or not. Self-care is always our goal, but... Um, you know this is about progress, not perfection. Um, now, many of you submitted questions about your children or grandchildren, including how uh, can you look after their mental health during this period and uh, what to do if your kids start experiencing separation anxiety once things go back to normal. Um, well, I mentioned resilience before. Remember that kids, your kids, are resilient, much more resilient than you and more than you may even know. Uh, their resilience, their ability to bounce back, comes from their adaptability. Their great ability to adapt to new circumstances still comes from their impressionability. They, they take in everything and they soak it in. Those new stimuli, they soak them in like sponges. It's important to remember this right now, as you may worry about how to talk to your kids about coronavirus. You have been so anxious, perhaps, about it, and that so much is unknown. How are you going to explain it to your kids, right? We'll start with this. They already know. Because remember, they are sponges. So with that, you'll want to check in and not avoid, because as much as we don't know, there are things we do. And as we are all aware and experiencing head-on, what we don't know can be much scarier than what we do. If your kids aren't getting information about this from you, they may be getting it from somewhere else, less reliable, like friends or what they read, and then interpreting and distorting that information in their minds, as you know. Because what else do we know about kids? Their imaginations are vast and can run wild. So worse yet is not having much information at all and allowing whatever thoughts they have about this virus to run rampant, as they can do with us. So my advice for you would be to keep it simple. Be concrete. Use tangible metaphors or comparisons. The best comparison is the flu, as many kids know about this, and we all have been contrasting this with that. You can explain that it's a virus, like the flu, but it's new and we don't know as much about it, so we have to be safe until there's more that we discover to help treat it. 
like medicine or a vaccine to prevent it, like there is with the flu. The other thing is, that's important is to keep their routines as close to normal as possible. Schedule online play dates. Try to simulate or replicate the structure of a school day with the online lear learning environment, which can be much more fluid and involve more independence. Parents do complain that there is not enough structure with it, but besides wanting to limit screen time, because we know that's gone out the window, or at best our limits have drastically expanded with that, it'll be hard for anyone to sit in front of the same screen for that long. But even simple scheduling with lunch, activity like PE, recess, peppered throughout the day, and then, you know, like after school activities, uh, is helpful. So if you set this in the morning, then you may not have to take as much time sorting it out throughout the day. Also, empower your kids. Let them help think of and build their own schedules. Let them help you clean the house or cook dinner. It can be fun for them and uh, as they look for anything to distract from the monotony and the boredom uh, prone situation we're in. Um, and for both of you, it can be fun and it'll help you get the work done. So it's a win-win-win. Um, also, you should help them provide support and to get involved. That's another way to empower, empower them. My wife and our kids make, have made cars for friends on the front line. And also, um, another thing you can do is have them decorate masks. Um, whenever school gets back in session on site or you have to return to work, if you've been at home, especially because it may be a while, you can expect separation anxiety, as it will be normal. So uh, you just should expect and anticipate that in itself. And doing that can go a long way in helping you manage the stress that comes with it. This is where compassion comes into play. Allow the time and know that it will be a process. Also, think of how you would feel having to go back to work and possible concerns or anxieties you'll face with that. It's the same with your kids. Think of it as you would any other year of sending kids back to school for the summer. Perhaps prepare them with getting a new outfit or supplies. Help them feel ready. Also, whatever the plans will be, it may come in phases. And while that may feel more discouraging, it may actually also be helpful in readjustment for your kids. Now, several of you have asked about loved ones in isolation. How can you stay connected and make sure it's not affecting their mental health. Certainly loneliness is a major issue during COVID-19. Many people may live alone or not have a chance to engage with loved ones regularly, at least in person, obviously. Connecting with loved ones is very important. Again, we have learned to appreciate the simple things. Just picking up the phone and making a regular plan to do that at a certain time of day, for instance, or any time can go a long way. If you do try to connect by video, again, taking it easy, taking advantage of what is perhaps more time, so there's not the pressure of what to talk about as much, and maybe it's just about the connection itself in that way. Take the time in connecting. Technology is helpful, but can be frustrating, so don't fret too much if it doesn't work. Again, a simple phone call can suffice. It's so important Conversely, to make sure you are reaching out if you are alone and feeling lonely. Following through on any ideas and writing them down to take action on them will be useful. Making a point of regularly calling any loved ones, connecting with people maybe you haven't spoken to in a long time is helpful. And uh, this is an opportunity uh, in, as this situation calls for it more naturally. Um, there are mental health resources and support groups available online and virtually. Those are useful. Finding and engaging volunteer activities online can be a source of fulfillment. Playing your favorite movies, treating yourself to your favorite meals, or trying new recipes or new places to take out food from, or taking up new hobbies or reading books you have been wanting to get to for a long time are just some ideas for how to take advantage of this situation. And with these ideas, maintaining and building some structure and routine into a schedule is so important to maintain your wellness and stability. It'll help you feel grounded and connected with your own world and yourself, even when confined. 
Now, lastly, we also received many questions that really showed how much anxiety there currently is around COVID-19. Is it safe to go outdoors? Should I be worried about sharing a house with my grandchild? Uh, Mitchell asked, is there a general way of dealing with anxiety? So I wanted to help provide a few tips around handling anxiety and stress. The early phases of this crisis saw a high level of anxiety as we buckled down and did what we had to do to get into isolation or quarantine or shelter in place and begin establishing a drastically different and rapidly changing way of life. As this continues, we grapple with coming to terms with how quickly things have changed, with beginning to try to make some sense of it all as we continue to deal with the loss of normalcy and how we can sustain this for weeks and months ahead. And then, how can we sensibly move back into the space of comfort and acceptance with some level of uncertainty that is always there as we go on with our lives? What will that actually look like? It's important to trust from any past experiences you may have had dealing with crisis. We've all had some, and you know that it will pass and you'll get through it in some way, shape, or form. You're here now, you've made it here, so perhaps you can feel safer in knowing that and that you have resources to do that again. Then just knowing that you're safe right now and have these resources to cope now can help you move away from worry about what things will look like eventually. Anxiety is all about anticipation of what is to come and not knowing for certain what that will be. It takes the sense of trust, knowing that you've gotten through things before and that it will be a process that will unfold with time. Kind of like driving a car through a thick fog. You take it slow and just look at the road immediately in front of you and follow the other cues of light and forms around you and eventually you get through it. We deal with more information about the battle with this pandemic. It can be overwhelming. It's okay and actually helpful to put that aside and do the other things I've mentioned as you would in a modified way with your day. Testing, antibodies, vaccines. The bottom line is that this is new and we are learning. So don't expect too much essential or earth shattering information that you could miss if you aren't watching or reading or keeping up to date. The path will unfold in due time. Meditation, even if it's not something you've practiced before or something you think you'd like or be good at, it's another thing you can take up like a hobby. Like exercise, it's just about doing it regularly, even for a few minutes a day, and you'll find eventually some benefits for feeling more calm, more centered, and getting a better perspective and awareness and even observing distance from those emotions and that anxiety that can be overwhelming a lot of the time. Eat healthy and exercise as you can. Hey, you don't have the same triggers out there to throw you off course or the busyness preventing you from this. Um, So you can do it in the privacy of your own home. Uh, These are some of the benefits of the situation and how to take advantage of this crisis. You can call and be creative in sharing with your children and grandchildren in connecting, but any in-person contact generally needs to wait. With that said, families are making their own plans about how to deal with this crisis now that days have turned to weeks and weeks to months, so that it's more sustainable even in the intermediate term. I just say that whatever decisions you make should be just that, planned, and seriously deliberated and considered before acting on them. You should consult the most fundamental guidelines, such as the CDC website or other resources, and consult with medical professionals and other experts. Intermittent and passing contact is generally not going to be advisable. If you're considering safe physical connection according to guidance, such as walking outside for necessary exercise with someone else at a social distance and with masks, If you think that can be done reliably, that might be considered, but kids are more unpredictable, and especially when they're your family and they have missed you so much, the urge to be close will probably be hard to resist. With that said, people may be further beginning to consider and carefully determining whether and how to expand their bubble of isolation, if you will. If family is in need of support in isolation and 
can safely be helped in this way. There may be a path to doing this with assurance that all parties are symptom free and or able to be in appropriate isolation and additionally quarantine from each other in the first weeks at the start of this move. And it, as long as it's possible to assure all comply with continued guidance for sheltering in place, then um, it could be a consideration, but you should discuss it further with your doctor and all the parties and families involved. Okay, so uh, I hope this was helpful, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Shepard. Thank you, Seth. My name is Dr. Beverly Shepard, Chair of the Department of Pediatrics for Advantage Care Physicians. Our department is comprised of 40 pediatricians. We care for 90,000 children throughout New York City in the five boroughs. Several of you asked about precautions you should take during this era of uh, coronavirus. Stacia asked, I have a four month old grandchild in my household and I am concerned for when New York City reopens, especially going on the bus or the subway to get to work. What precautions can I take? What can I do when the city reopens? Well, Stacia, there's several things that you can do. One of the things that I recommend is continuing to wear a face mask. If you're going to be traveling on crowded subways and buses, I would recommend that you continue to that practice to help avoid uh, contact with people who may be potentially uh, contagious. Social distancing is very difficult to do on a crowded bus or, or train, uh, so the mask, I think, would come in very handy. Also, I recommend that you wear gloves or carry a paper towel or some sort of disposable wipe so that when you're touching the poles in the, on the trains or the strap hangers on the buses, you'll have another form of protection. When you come home, I recommend that, if, especially if you have on clothes where you're working with uh, people who may potentially be contagious, that you remove those clothes, even though the risk may be small, remove those clothes, place them in a laundry bag with a drawstring, and change into something that you don't ordinarily wear outside. The next recommendation is washing your hands as frequently as possible. When you think about it, wash your hands and have hand sanitizer available for those times when soap and water may not be available. Some of you mentioned fears about taking your child to the doctor right now and whether there's anything you should definitely not skip. Well, that's a very important question because you definitely should not skip your child's immunizations. We immunize children starting as early as six weeks, we starting actually at birth and at six weeks of age, six, as early as six to eight weeks of age, they receive their first immunizations. Now, why is that? Because some of those diseases, those vaccine pre preventable diseases that we protect your children against when we immunize them, can be seen as early as several months of age in infancy. And these diseases can be devastating. So we do recommend during this time of the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis that you continue to immunize your children at the appropriate appointed time. Two months, four months, six months, nine month old checkups. Please keep those appointments. It's very, very important. We at Advantage Care Physicians are making every effort to ensure that when you bring your babies in for those appointments, that is, it's in a very safe environment. We have designated particular rooms for newborns. We try to schedule infants in the morning so that they're not there later in the day when other children are coming in. And we're spacing out the appointments so that we don't have clustering in the waiting room, so that we don't have people in too close contact where we're not adhering to social distancing. We're washing our hands, of course, frequently because we're doctors, of course, and we, we, we're, using, uh, we're using facial masks. When it's indicated, we will put on full PPE when we think that that's an indication that there is a possibility of infection. So please, I cannot stress this enough. We saw a measles outbreak last year because there were areas in the city in which children were not being immunized. With this crisis that we're currently experiencing, the last thing we want to see is an outbreak of whooping cough or polio or measles or German measles. So please have your children immunized. If you have any questions or concerns about the safety in your office, please contact your pediatrician. Andrea asks, if my son had Kawasaki's disease at age two, and now that it is becoming a symptom of coronavirus, is he immune to catching it again? Well, Andrea, Kawasaki's is not an infection, so you cannot develop immunity to Kawasaki's. 
Kawasaki is an, is, an, is an entity in which the immune system sort of goes awry and you have diffuse inflammation throughout the body, which can lead to the most serious complication of cardiac failure. Uh, so no, your child will not be immune to Kawasaki's, but I've never heard of any cases of if a child had Kawasaki's that they, would, that they get it again several years later. I also am not aware, and I don't, do not believe that there is, is any data showing that if you had Kawasaki's in the past, that you are immune to coronavirus. So please continue to adhere to those safety precautions that we recommend. Washing your hands, facial mask, uh, hand sanitizer, social distancing. You are not immune to getting coronavirus because you've had Kawasaki's, and there is no immunity to Kawasaki's. If you get coronavirus and it leads to the diffuse inflammatory syndrome, you can have Kawasaki-like symptoms, but that, that does not necessarily mean that you have Kawasaki's again. Oh, we have questions coming in asking about wearing masks and what age should children begin to wear masks. Well, the CDC recommends that a child should wear a mask starting at age two and over. Now, these masks should not be the regular surgical masks or the N95 masks because they tend to be too small for the child's face and does not make a, 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 an, an appropriate fit. You can easily make masks at home out of any material that you have that would properly fit your child's face. If your child is under the age of two, the CDC does not recommend masks because it can lead to suffocation. Another question that we've asked is about the fact that we're now in allergy season. And it can be very difficult sometimes to determine whether or not it's a cold, allergies, or are these symptoms of COVID-19 infection? That's a very good question, and many people are asking that. And it can be challenging to, to discern the difference between those three, those three entities. Usually with a cold, you tend not to be as sick. The fever tends not to be as pronounced. You may have low-grade fever, coughing, sniffling, runny nose, but you don't feel as bad. You may not feel great, but you don't feel terrible. With allergies, you have symptoms of coughing, sneezing, runny nose, watery, itchy eyes. Usually you don't see fever with allergies. If you have fever, you may consider that another diagnosis may be, may, you, you may have an, a, another diagnosis. Now, with coronavirus, coronavirus, you, many patients tend to have very high fevers and the fevers tend to be persistent. There's body aches, there's weakness, there's cough, there's shortness of breath. Though these symptoms tend to be milder in children, children will tend to look sick if they do have coronavirus and they actually have an active infection taking place. If you have any doubts at all, that is a time to contact your pediatrician at Advantage Care Physicians so that perhaps maybe a virtual visit or a in-person visit would be in order to determine what exactly is happening with your child. Finally, some of you have asked, what should I do if I'm concerned that my child has contracted COVID-19? Well, I'd like to reassure most of you parents out there that the majority of children who contract COVID-19 experience a mild disease. The symptoms tend to be milder. There may be some fever, some body aches, some weakness, some lethargy, some uh, decrease in appetite, but for the most part, children get better. I know that there's a small percentage of children that do develop into more serious complications requiring respiratory support and can, and can, and can also progress to the inflammatory syndrome that we now have seen. Rest assured though, if you have any questions at all, this is the time to contact your pediatrician. This is the time to come in and have your child evaluated to determine what exactly is happening. <clears throat> and so finally, I'd like to conclude by saying, we are all in this together. I know you've heard that phrase multiple, multiple times. It's on the news, it's in commercials. But it is true, we are in this together. And be assured that we at Advantage Care Physicians, the pediatricians are here to help both you and your children get through this. We're here to provide the support and the encouragement that you need so that your children continue to remain healthy, strong, and safe. Again, I encourage you to contact us with any questions or issues. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Resnick, and Dr. Shepard for those very informative answers to all of our questions. On behalf of the Emblem Health and ACPNY families, 
All of us want to make sure that all of you watching, just remember, wash your hands, wear a mask, stand six feet apart, and make sure that you listen to the advice that our doctors have given this evening. Keep in mind you have chronic care issues, make sure you're attending to those needs. If you need information about virtual health and how to get and access virtual health, you'll find it here along with home delivery of medications. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep you safe. So stay safe and thank you very much for joining.